Good morning, everybody. I'm gonna wait a minute here until everyone makes it into the Zoom from the waiting room. And I think that's all of us. Thank you all so much for joining us today. We are recording the meeting today. I remembered this week. Thank you again for the person who reminded me last week. We are glad that you're with us today. We have a ton of questions that were submitted to us in the past week. We have at least 16 questions that were submitted in advance. So we're gonna to try to get through all of them and we're gonna to try to move as quickly as we can. I'm just giving you all a heads up on that. And I also just put into the chat a little message thanking you all for being here. We do that because it's nice, but also because it kind of pops up and flashes for those of you that are not familiar with Zoom and are wondering where the chat function is. So take a look at your Zoom toolbar, which should be across the bottom of your screen, regardless of what kind of device that you're using. You have the option of stopping and starting your video if you would like privacy or would you if you would like us to see you as you participate in the Zoom today. And as a reminder, we do have everybody in the meeting muted right now, except for Ken and I. This reduces background noise, but you're welcome to unmute yourself if you would like to ask a question verbally at any time. And again, pop your questions into the chat. We're gonna move through our content today as quickly as we can so we can answer as many of your questions as we can. And one last reminder, if we don't get to your question today, or if you think of another one, you know, day after tomorrow, and you think you're gonna forget it before next Wednesday, send it via email to info at condolaw.net. That's info at condolaw.net. We monitor that email throughout the week and that's where the 16 questions that we have to answer today came from. So without further ado, we'll kind of keep moving forward through the content today. I do wanna remind everybody that the CAI journal is going to have a memorial to Gil Price in the next issue that's published. So if you're interested in reading people's stories about Gil, be sure to pay attention when that next issue of the journal comes out. We've had a lot of people ask us whether there's gonna be a memorial and his husband has shared with us that he's not gonna do a memorial per se, but there will be a celebration of life at some point, we think in August. As soon as that information becomes available to us, we will share it with you all here and <clears throat> on the Condominium Law Group Facebook page as well. So I wanna start before we get into our content by giving you our standard disclaimer, which is that we are here today not to answer specific questions or give specific legal advice for any specific association. Can I overuse the word specific any more than I have just done? <laughs> so we're here for general information. We cannot give you legal advice. When questions are very, very specific or detailed, we generally um, are looking at legal advice as opposed to general information. We try to at least cover the topic raised by those types of questions anyways. There will be a couple of those today where we specifically call it out that we're probably not gonna be able to answer your question, but here's some general information that might be helpful. So keep that in mind. Briefly, before we jump into the questions, I do wanna cover kind of our usual suspects. The first is that Proclamation 20-51 has been or will be rescinded effective 11.59 p.m. on July 24th. And conveniently, Senate Bill 5011 takes effect on July 25th. So there will be a seamless transition between those two uh, pieces of, well, I guess the proclamation isn't litigation, or sorry, legislation, but close enough. So as a reminder, Proclamation 20-51 prohibits late fees and interest. It also allows associations to conduct meetings remotely and to do voting by mail. Again, that one will expire at 11.59 on July 24th. I've already had a couple of clients email asking if they can start charging late fees on the 25th. And what we're telling people in general is that it is easier and, and lowest risk if you just wait and start things fresh on August 1st. You're really close to the end of the month anyways on the 25th, which would be the first day that late fees and interest are allowed. If you have a specific community that's late, that has a late fee that's normally assessed on the 30th of the month, or if you have other questions about how you should handle this for specific associations that you manage or that you're a member of, contact your association attorney so they can give you specific advice on how best to proceed. So again, Senate Bill 5011 takes effect on July 25th. 
In addition to allowing remote meetings and voting by mail, it adds the option of sending notices to your owners electronically on an opt-in basis. That means you can't force your owners to accept notice electronically, but you can allow them to opt into that. Another piece of legislation to be aware of is House Bill 1482, which actually took effect on May 10th, so it's been a couple months now. That is the one that creates some threshold dollar amounts and some prerequisites that you have to meet before an association can foreclose on its lien for unpaid assessments. And we also want to remind everybody that on July 25th, the recording fees are going to increase by $100 a piece. Currently, it costs $103.50 for the first page of any document you record and a dollar for every page thereafter. Beginning July 25th, it's going to cost $203.50 for the first page. So if you have documents that need recorded and you think you can get that information to your attorney in time to make it happen, you're getting to the point where that, that is less and less likely to be possible. So just be aware of that recording fee increase. The other thing that it makes sense to pay attention to with respect to that recording fee increase is how it changes sort of the decision-making equation at the beginning of a collection file when you refer an account to your association council, whether it makes sense to send the demand letter on its own and wait 30 days before recording the lien. Because if you do the lien and the demand, and then of course, keeping in mind the cost of the lien release, the cost of all of that together is gonna to be pushing, under our fee agreement, it's pushing $1,000 just to do a demand letter, a lien and a lien release. Uh, because over $400 of that is just recording fees. So keep that in mind and maybe consider consult, consulting with your attorney about demand letters only to begin with and whether there are communities that should be more proactive about recording liens, those that don't have lien priority, for example, or those without resale certificate requirements. And just as a reminder, the eviction moratorium was extended through September 30th. We only mention that because sometimes these issues are kind of peripherally, you know, um, have an effect on our communities. The statewide burn ban remains in effect and currently is going, going to extend through September 30th. There was some indication from the governor's office that it might be extended depending on how dry the winter and the early, or sorry, the summer and the early fall are. And the Homeowner Assistance Fund, which is a part of the American Rescue Plan Act, includes relief for homeowners and community associations uh, because it includes assessments as housing costs, which can be eligible to be paid through that fund. So again, the legislation is called the American Rescue Plan Act and the part of it that provides for payment of assessments as housing costs is the Homeowner Assistance Fund. And I'm sticking a link into the chat now that gives you more information about that fund. So I think that's record time for me to get through all of our sort of normal every week stuff because we wanted to spend as much time as we could on our questions. So Ken, did you have anything else you wanted to say before I jump right into those? No, I'm good. Okay, the first question that we had to, that we got by email to cover this week. I was hoping we could have a little clarification with the proclamation and Zooms. Are associations allowed to hold Zoom meetings still even if their documents are not amended to allow it? The very short answer to this question is yes. Currently under the proclamation, you're allowed to do this. And when the proclamation expires, Senate Bill 5011 is going to take effect and Senate Bill 5011 will allow remote meetings. And you do not have to amend your documents in order to take advantage of this option. However, owners who are seeking to challenge association actions are almost always gonna look at the governing documents to see if they think what you're doing matches up with the doc what the documents allow. And if they don't know about Senate Bill 5011, that can create confusion and might you know, lead the owners to assert that the association is doing things wrong as a result. So it might be something associations want to consider that is amending their documents, whether it's the declaration or the bylaws, so that the documents are consistent with what is currently or will now be allowed under Senate Bill 5011, just to eliminate or reduce that confusion on the, on the part of owners who are looking at the documents saying, hey, wait a minute, you're supposed to send notice this way or you're supposed to have meetings this way. So that's the short answer to the question. You don't have to amend your documents, but you might wanna consider it. Ken, did you have something you wanted to add? 
Yeah, one thing to keep in mind is that the statute as it's revised does still allow the bylaws to prohibit a Zoom meeting. It's just that the default under the old statute was you could only do a Zoom meeting if the bylaws specifically allowed it. And now the default statute will be you can do a Zoom meeting unless the bylaws prohibit it. So if you have a community that objects to Zoom meetings, it is possible for them to amend the bylaws to require in-person meetings. Um, I'm not sure why you would want to do that. But what this did is as long as your document is silent about the type of meeting, you are allowed to have the Zoom meetings. Thanks, Ken. I'm going to move into our next question. As always, I do want to remind you that if you need clarification or you have related questions, go ahead and pop them into the chat. The next question is this. We are a condominium association with 221 units and reopened our pool, gym, clubhouse, et cetera, at the end of June. We recently received a request from several homeowners who would like to designate one evening per week to have an adults only use of the pool. Is this allowable or is it discriminating against those under 21 who may want to use the pool? <clears throat> the short answer is that it's not allowable if you only have one pool. Rules that are target, targeted towards children only, <clears throat> that you limit the use of amenities to adults only or that otherwise target either children or family status are impermissible discrimination and can lead to uh, Fair Housing Act complaints, which really never end well for an association, especially if you are in fact discriminating based on age or family status. Ken did mention that he has seen one exception in, in the case law, which is that if there's a community that has more than one swimming pool, you could designate certain times in one of the pools to be adults only because that still leaves another pool that's always an option for families with kids. And so the discrimination issue is less, less of an issue in that particular scenario. So you can designate certain activities or certain times during which the pool is limited to certain types of activities. So you could have, you know, uh, five to six is laps, lap swimming only kind of thing. You could also even have something like quiet hours if the, I'm not really sure that's the best term that, that you would want to use, but um, that would create a little bit more peaceful atmosphere in your pool, for example, for limited periods of time. Um, but you can't do any of this based on the age of the people using the pool or family status. So hopefully that answers the question clearly. And we are going to move on to the next one. Um, I sent a violation letter to a homeowner and she is saying it is not legal or enforceable because the board did not sign the letter. Is this true? Again, short answer, no, it's not true. There are lots of definitions of what a record of the association looks like. And most recently, Senate Bill 5011 and Wakiowa both define a record and or a writing. And a record does not require a signature to be an actual record of the association. And as a practical matter, not only is there no statutory requirement that letters from the association be signed by the board, also who's, who signs for the board? The board is not like one person, it's a group of three or five or seven people. How do you decide who gets to sign it? It also would make professional management practically impossible if a board member or the board, all of the board members had to sign every single notice that was mailed by your management company to your homeowners. So. Unless the governing documents for your association provide otherwise, which I have never seen, letters that are sent by the association's managing agent, which would include the management company and or the individual manager, are just as effective, I guess, for lack of a better word, as a letter sent by the board. So the most important thing to do when dealing with violation letters, of course, is to make sure that the board, the board is involved in the decision making process and is handling violations correctly. So this would include things like uh, being made aware of the, the complaint of the violation, investigating um, whether the violation occurred, making a, a determination as to whether the violation occurred, etc. So that's the most important thing. Board signature is, is really kind of irrelevant. Ken, did you want to comment further on that before I keep moving? No, I'm good. Okay. So next question, is it customary for an HOA 
to have an attorney retainer agreement with an attorney who represents them as opposed to a simple fee agreement. Our HOA is telling us, actually, I'm just gonna leave it there. I don't think I need to read all the details um, because those are not relevant to the answer to the question, which is whether it's customary to have a retainer agreement versus a fee agreement. Most law firms in our region and practice area use a fee agreement rather than a retainer agreement. Retainer agreements are a lot more common on the East Coast in some, and in some you know, larger cities in California. And what a retainer agreement does is it means you pay a monthly or annual fee simply for the privilege of being the client of the law firm. <laughs> um, but then you pay extra for any legal services that you actually request from the attorney that, that works for you. So they're not super common in Western Washington. I would say industry standard here is that a, uh, law firms operate with the use of a fee agreement instead and generally don't charge retainer fees. Some firms do require a fee deposit. And in particular, if you're a new client to the firm and or if there's a really big project coming up, they may want to, they may ask you to make a deposit, which would be held in the firm's trust account. And essentially they bill against that fee deposit for the cost of the project that they're working on for you. That's not the same thing as a retainer agreement. Retainer agreement is not very common and certainly not in our practice area here. So Ken, did you wanna to add to that? Yeah, I guess I would have said the retainer would typically mean you've paid money in advance and the agreement would explain how that fee would be distributed between the law firm and the client at the end of their representation. And so if you're a law firm that never accepts or never requests money in advance, and our firm never requests money in advance, you don't need a retainer agreement. It's very common to have with um, individuals who are represented by attorneys, the attorneys in DUI cases, uh, in family matters and estates will frequently have uh, a requirement that fees be paid in advance and often those fees are considered earned whether you uh, actually have them complete the services or not. And so it, it, it starts to become potentially much more complex. We try and keep things very simple and uh, so we have a, a two page fee agreement. Thanks, Ken. All right, the next question that came in to us in advance is this. I got a $100 fine for forgetting to put my tags on my car. Zero tolerance, even though I could run upstairs to grab the sticker, they said it was an automatic $100 fine. Are HOAs required to give some time to remedy before issuing a fine? So this is gonna be one of those questions where I need to make it really clear, like what I said in the beginning of the Zoom, which is that we can't comment specifically on what happened in this particular scenario, whether your association did things correctly or not, but we can give some general information and thoughts about fines and warnings and things like that. So there is no legal requirement that an association issue a warning before fining an owner for violating the rules. Some associations do have their fine policy set up or their fine schedule set up so that the first violation um, indicates that a warning is, is appropriate. And then after that first violation and warning has been sent, subsequent violations result in a fine, okay? Not every association has that kind of fine structure. Some of them, the first violation automatically leads to a fine. And the most important thing, as I mentioned earlier, is that the association follow its process correctly. So some associations are, we, we know there's some confusion in the industry about whether you have to whether you can find that a violation has occurred before you give a due process notification. And the answer to that question is that you can. The board can determine that a violation has occurred before fining the owner, before giving the owner due process. And in fact, that has to happen before due process and a fine can be assessed. There is a legal due process requirement, which essentially means that the association has to notify the owner that they have the right to request a hearing before the fine can be assessed. So generally what this looks like is there's a violation that occurs or somebody reports a violation to the association. The board looks at the report of the violation, does whatever investigation that is necessary to determine whether a violation occurred and then decides, yep, a violation did occur. And they send a fine notice to the owner 
And the notice itself has to contain due process notification. And it might be as something as simple as a sentence that says, you have the right to request a hearing before this fine is assessed. If you would like to request a hearing, please contact the manager within 10 days of the date of this letter. If you do not request a hearing, a fine may be assessed to your account on X date. So that's what due process looks like. The so you can determine that the violation has occurred, send the notice to the owner. If the notice contains the appropriate due process notification and the owner doesn't request a fine, then the board can decide to go ahead and fine the owner. If the board, if the member does request a hearing, then the hearing has to occur before the board can then vote on whether to assess the fine, notwithstanding the contents of the hearing and, and what took place at the hearing. So Ken, did you wanna add anything to that? Yeah, the idea that a fine is automatic is contrary to how the statutes are written. The statutes require an opportunity to be heard before the fine can be assessed for every type of community and every statute which communities function under. So we have a lot of clients where they will issue rules that we review and they want a $500 fine immediately assessed when some event occurs or a $100 fine every time something occurs. And those are not gonna be enforceable fines because the opportunity to be heard was not offered before the fine was assessed. You don't have to change your mind at the hearing, but you have to have a hearing and the courts have held that the hearing has to be a legitimate opportunity for the owner to speak and that the board is listening because we've got court cases in other states where the board basically said, well, we'll hold a hearing, but we're gonna fine you anyway. And where that happened, the courts ruled that the board had not fulfilled its obligations and the fines were not enforceable in law. Thanks, Ken. Um, I just want to remind people to please make sure that you stay on mute unless you have a question that you want to ask. I don't know whether we're having technical difficulties today, but uh, several people have, I think, inadvertently unmuted themselves. And I keep trying to push the button and keep you all on mute, but if you could try to help, that would be great. Okay, so the next question that came in in advance is, and I should also let you know, I, I do see that there have been at least two questions that have been submitted to me since we started the Zoom. I'm going to ignore questions that are not sort of specific follow-ups related to what we're talking about and get to them at the end of today if we have time. And if we don't have time, like I said at the beginning, please send your questions to info at condolaw.net and we'll make sure that they get on the top of the list for next week. So just letting you know that I do see those, I'm not ignoring them. Well, I am, but I mean, there's a reason behind it. So the next question that came in ahead of time is this, should a board prepare minutes for a unanimous approval to do a repair or maintenance? Example, HOA board doesn't meet very often, had annual meeting in June, discussed the need for tree trimming, bids were received and reviewed, board unanimously approved the bid via email and is getting scheduled. Would preparing minutes of this email <laughs> approval be a good idea? So there's no such thing as minutes for an email approval, but you're going in the right direction because it is important that you memorialize the board's decision. Any board decision that is made outside of a board meeting has to be unanimous and in writing and an email counts. And then the way that you memorialize it is that at your next board meeting, you ratify the decision then and you place record of that decision in the board meeting minutes for the next meeting. You can attach the emails to the minutes as evidence of that unanimous written consent outside of the board meeting. Um, and it is really important that you keep a record of these things and that you keep, for example, that unanimous email thread. And briefly, I'll mention a case that I think I've mentioned in our Zoom before, in which an association board approved a foreclosure lawsuit unanimously via email. And when the lawsuit was filed, the owner hired an attorney who challenged the association or the board decision and who attempted to subpoena the emails in which the board approved uh, the decision to proceed with the foreclosure. It was a little complicated because those emails were attorney-client privileged communications because it was an email thread that included me and the board members. And ultimately the subpoena was quashed, but the, the judge asked to review the email thread 
in camera, which means the board, the, the judge looks at it, but it doesn't get disclosed to anybody else. So it still protects the, the privilege. And if we did not, or if we had not had that record of the unanimous board decision, I don't think that case would have gone very well for our client. So that's just one example of why it is very important to have a record of these decisions. So the other thing that I want to say with respect to this question is, the lawyer in me cringed a little bit when I heard that you don't meet very often. What I advise my clients to do is to meet regularly, at minimum quarterly. My preference would be monthly or maybe even every other month, I guess. That's stretching it a little bit for me. But it's really hard to believe that an association, unless you're a really tiny HOA, you know, we do have some clients that are 13 lots in an HOA with very little actual business to conduct throughout the year. But if you're a community that does have business to conduct throughout the year and board decisions are required, the gold standard for board decisions is for them to be made in board meetings. And especially now that remote meetings are fully allowed, the only requirement for a board meeting to occur is that it be in real time and that it offer all of the board members the opportunity to hear and interact with each other in real time. So it can be a teleconference, it can be a Zoom thing. You could do it on the Facebook chat video function that I still haven't figured out how to use, but there are a million free platforms that you can use to conduct meetings remotely. And also board meetings don't have to be endless, especially if you're a community that typically doesn't meet often, um, you know, your board doesn't meet often, you probably could set up, say, meetings every, every month or every other month. And if you are really disciplined about staying on track, you could be done in an hour or less. So, so I just wanted to tell you that cringy reaction that I had to the fact that you don't meet often. And I, I, my preference would be, and I think associations are generally best served by boards who do meet on a regular basis, even if it isn't every single month. The other thing to be aware of though, is if you are meeting using a teleconference system or Zoom or whatever, you know, remote system that you might use. And if you're in a community that requires open board meetings, make sure your owners are aware of when the meetings are occurring and how they can observe those meetings as well. Ken, did you want to add anything to that before I keep moving? No, I'm good. Okay. All right. Next question. Marijuana smells. Pot is legal in Washington, but does that mean one resident can smoke it in their yard all day long and prevent other neighbors from enjoying their backyards due to the stink? How does an association board deal with this type of complaint? So um, Washington law treats pot smoking the same as cigarette smoking. You can't enforce more harshly when an owner smokes pot because it smells worse to you or generates more complaints than somebody who smokes cigarettes in their backyard. And if you don't enforce against owners who smoke cigarettes in their backyards, then I think you you set yourself up for claims of selective enforcement if you start enforcing against owners who smoke pot in their backyard. Legally, it is exactly the same. And so you have to treat them exactly the same. So this doesn't mean that you can't enforce at all, but smoking within an owner's property is, it's a use of their property and restricting somebody's use of their property generally has to happen in the form of uh, an amendment to the CCNRs, if, for example, you were considering trying to ban smoking within your community entirely. And um, that's problematic and difficult to get done in most communities. You maybe can use the rule against any noxious or offensive activity. There's that language that appears in most declarations and CCNRs that says that no owner can engage in any activity in their property that is noxious and offensive to the, the neighbors. So you can find owners maybe who smoke too much under that section of the CCNRs, but then that becomes problematic, I think. Who gets to decide what's too much? And are you applying the same standard, like I said before, to those who smoke cigarettes, tobacco cigarettes versus smoking pot? Um, the other thing is that you can just ask owners to be mindful of their neighbors when they're smoking anything in their yards. And you can also remind their neighbors, meaning the neighbors of the smokers, that it isn't the association's role to mediate every single dispute between neighbors. So if this is an issue about which the board does not, if the board does not have a passion for kind of wading into the middle of this issue and turning it into an enforcement issue, I don't think you have to. I don't think the board is required to 
jump into these kinds of disputes and take an aggressive enforcement stance when dealing with owners who are complaining about their neighbors smoking in their own backyard. So the other thing that we do wanna mention briefly is that the appellate cases in Washington state, there is an appellate case that specifically found that cigarette smoke is not considered a common law nuisance. And I think that it's not a stretch to assume the courts would, would do the same thing with respect to marijuana smoke. And so, especially in communities that have older documents where nuisance is not defined, uh, enforcement against pot smoking in somebody's backyard might become a little more problematic than it would otherwise be. So, Ken, did you want to add anything else before I keep moving on that? I, no, I. it is certainly possible that some kind of smoke is going to be worse than other. So I know people might find cigar smoke different than cigarette smoke. And so maybe pot smoke could be different. So there's certainly the potential that the circumstances uh, would be different than what the court found was not a nuisance in the case that was before them. But that case was a townhome community where one owner would uh, smoke cigarettes on his back deck and the wind would blow the smoke into the neighboring window. And the, the neighbor who sued to try and stop the cigarette smoke lost both at the trial level and the appellate level. And it's different. We, we do write a specific provision in uh, documents when we revise them to clarify that smoke is a nuisance so that we don't have to worry about the common law standard, which has been established by the courts to allow more potential for enforcement. But also I wanna you know, remind that this could be a neighbor to neighbor dispute, which the board could stay out of because we typically do recommend that the board stay out of disputes between two individual owners, whether it's about views or cigarette smoke or noise. Thanks, Ken. And for what it's worth, I hate smoke. I it makes me I, I'm mildly allergic to most types of smoke. I used to live in an apartment and I there was nothing I hated more than when somebody's cigarette smoke would drift in in from their balcony into my apartment. Um, so it's not that we don't recognize that it's that it can be noxious and offensive and super annoying. It's just a question of whether it's legally actionable. And in a lot of cases, I think it would be better not to get involved in these, dispute, these disputes. The next question that we had come in from listener was this, can the board refuse to accept emails from all owners and instead pass them on to the property manager? Is it an abdication of the duty of care and their responsibility to serve the community? Can the added cost of this be disputed by the owners? So, I'm not entirely sure that I understand the question exactly as it's intended, but I'm going to give some general information about how associations can handle owner communications. And if the general information that we give here doesn't answer your question, then you might need to consult with an attorney because some of this also could be dictated by the governing documents for your community. So as a starting point, I wanna mention that an association can adopt a communications policy that tells owners the appropriate method to use in communicating with the board members. And certainly that communication policy can direct all owners to send their communications via email to the manager as a starting point. And the communications policy can also remind owners that individual board members don't have any authority outside of their membership on the board as a whole. And so sending emails to me as a board member individually is not gonna get you any further than just sending it to the manager so it can be handled at, you know, kind of in the normal course of business through normal channels versus, you know, cornering me in the parking lot and asking me questions or sending me emails personally as a board member. You can also limit the timing and the number of responses that owners should expect. And you can spell that out a little bit in the collection policy. So we've all bumped into that owner at one point or another, those of you who are managers more than one point or another, I'm sure who sends, you know, 10 or 20 emails a week and uh, just as more high maintenance in general than other owners. And so you can say, look, we're not gonna respond to every single email that you send unless there's something that's urgent or emergency nature. Instead, we're gonna look, look at all of them when the board reviews owner communications and you're gonna get one response if, if a response is warranted, right? Certain emails, no response is warranted. If it's just somebody sort of kind of 
complaining about things, but not asking for a specific result or a specific response, there may not be a response warranted depending on what the communication is. So on to the part about whether the board should refuse outright to review owner emails, I don't think that that's a great idea. And the board cannot delegate its duty of care to the manager. So instead of just ignoring all owner emails and refusing to ever read them, what makes sense to me is that a system is put in place for how owners send their communications to the association and when and how the board reviews, reviews those communications and then how responses are handled. I think that that will help a board that's feeling overwhelmed by too many man, uh, owner emails manage the, the level of overwhelm that they might be experiencing. And it helps manage owner expectations as well. So as to the question about whether the time the manager spends reviewing those emails, like if owners can dispute the costs, I'm not sure whether the question is intending to ask about increased management costs overall because the manager has to review those emails or whether you're asking about whether the cost of the manager reviewing your emails can be assessed to your account. And the answer to that question, if it's the latter, is really dependent on the circumstances and the governing documents for the community. So I can't really answer it um, in the context of this Zoom Q&A. But I hope this at least generally covers the topic of the question. Ken, did you want to add anything before I keep moving? No, I'm good. Okay. All right, I told you guys we had a lot of questions. <laughs> The next one is, if a purchaser plans on violating the rental restrictions in the CCNRs and is willing to pay any fines that are levied, currently $30 a day, is there more than an For example, can the association uh, Yes, the short answer is you can absolutely file a lawsuit asking the court to declare that the owner is in violation of the governing documents and ordering the owner to stop the violation. So anytime you're dealing with an owner violation, we do generally recommend taking sort of the most cooperative approach and only escalating to the more aggressive options if and as necessary. So, you know, you, if all the cooperative measures have failed and then you've fined the owner and that has not brought them into compliance, you can consider a number of things. You can consider not enforcing the rule if the cost of the legal process is not worth it to the association. You could also, consider having your association attorney send an, a demand letter essentially to the owner, asking them or demanding that they stop the violating activity and explaining to them what the violation is. And also explaining to them that if they don't stop doing it, the association would consider litigation, which could add costs to the owner's account under certain circumstances. You can also request that the owner voluntarily submit the dispute to mediation or to binding arbitration. So alternative dispute resolution can be useful in certain types of disputes. But if all else fails and if the board feels very strongly that the violation needs to be addressed and they don't wanna allow it to continue, you can file a lawsuit asking the court for a declaratory judgment, finding that the owner is in violation and ordering them to stop the violation. The cost of of a compliance lawsuit like that is generally probably five to $10,000 just to get it started, to get it drafted, filed, served on the owner, et cetera. And then the cost of litigation can get a lot higher if the owner contests the lawsuit, which in general with these types of lawsuits is more common than in, for example, a collections lawsuit. And also they can file counterclaims against the association and that could trigger insurance claims and insurance defense coverage maybe depending on the nature of the claims. So, uh, so yes, there are other options, but they can be costly and they can be complicated. So it really is something you need to decide with the assistance of your association attorney. Did you wanna to add to that, Ken, before I keep going? No, I'm good. Okay, all right. Next question I'm gonna answer. I have a homeowner requesting to see all communications about a project that is taking place, including emails, votes via email that were ratified in the minutes and, or sorry, in, ratified in meetings and placed in board in the minutes, bid comparisons, all communications that pertain to the project, et cetera. Do we really have to show them everything like email and communication from professionals or architects, engineers, the county? We don't have documents to prove what the architects and engineers or county recommended, but in the minutes it states what was discussed 
and what county rule, rules were that pertain to that project. So I wanna start by saying we covered this topic in a fair amount of detail last week. So be sure to go back and watch the Q&A from July 14th, where we talked a lot about association records and what needs to be included when an owner requests the opportunity to review them and what can be withheld. But the TLDR from all of that last week is that the member right to review records does include most records, and I'll get into that in a second, with few limitations. The records you can withhold from owner review include things like attorney client privileged communications, personnel and medical records, contracts that are currently under negotiation. So if you're in the middle of the competitive bidding process or you're negotiating a lease or you know anything that's currently under negotiation or being bid, that can be withheld from a current request for owner to review records. Um, unlisted telephone numbers and email addresses of owners, things like that. Wakiowa contains a really good list of what an association, what is included in association records and what can be withheld from owners when they ask to review those records. And Wakiowa, the reference is RCW 6490-495. And even though that's not binding on many of our communities in Washington state, it's really, it's a really great starting point for figuring out what you have to disclose and what you don't. Um, in, in, in this particular scenario that's described by the manager that submitted this question, the email where the board voted to approve something, I think that is an association record, right? That's the record of the board decision, like we just talked about earlier when we were talking about ratifying it and putting it in the minutes and then attaching the email to the minutes if you, if you wanted to have the, the record of the unanimous board decision. But emails in general, we have, we have generally advised our clients that emails are not a record of the association. And so depending on the types of emails that you're talking about, some of them should be disclosed and many of them do not have to be disclosed. Um, the other thing I'll mention is that chapter 42 of our handbook, of our most recent book, covers this topic in a fair amount of detail. So if you would like a copy of that chapter, send an email to info at condolaw.net. And hopefully that at least gives you a starting point to get you pointed in the right direction about how to respond to those owner requests. And uh, Ken, I just looked at the questions again, and so far none of them are specifically relevant to um, the questions that I've covered so far. So go ahead and take over and then we'll get to these if we have time. Okay, so first question I have is uh, in a large heavily wooded association is the association responsible for, for proactively preventing damage from healthy trees? Uh, and then this goes on to talk about how even healthy trees can have branches fall off and asks if the cost of performing maintenance to reduce branches falling off trees could be assessed exclusively to the owners who live near the trees. So I'm not sure if this is an HOA or a condominium, but either way, any ability to assess costs differently to some owners than others would be provided for in your CCNRs or your declaration. So you would have to consult that. I would offer that generally, if these are healthy trees, there is gonna be no way that you could justify uh, doing maintenance on them under most CCNRs, especially if you're talking native growth protection areas, which many counties or cities have required be set up. Uh, unless a tree has been designated as a hazard tree by an arborist, you would not have the ability to go in and perform maintenance on them. So whether or not an association should try and go in and be pruning or limbing healthy trees or not is going to be a decision of the board and made under the provisions of the CCNRs. Maybe an arborist would tell you that's a reasonable thing to do, but unless the CCNRs are very specific in telling you that you can assess a cost like that to individual owners, it would be a common expense for the association. You know, we do have associations where there are some units that are benefiting from trimming for views and the costs of preserving those views can be assessed specifically to individual owners but it would probably have to be detailed in your documents for you to do something other than treat it as a common expense. Okay. Uh, question two is, is an association responsible for removing weeds? 
such as blackberry bushes that are encroaching on neighbor properties from the association's unmaintained wetlands and sensitive areas. This ends up being kind of a similar question on what obligation is there to maintain uh, you know, the, the common areas in many wetlands and native growth areas or sensitive areas, there are very specific restrictions on the association's ability to deal with blackberry bushes or other plants. Uh, we do have some communities where the county has set specific guidelines on which non-native plants like blackberries can be removed from those native growth areas. But I would say the general rule would be the association has no obligation to deal with the property once it crosses the property line onto the lots of the neighbors, even if the blackberry bushes are growing from common area onto the private area. The individual owners have responsibility for the land of their lot and uh, whatever their responsibility is to find the CCNRs is their obligation. So I, you know, I don't think that most associations should be trying to take on additional duties to benefit individual lots related to landscaping that uh, infringes from the HOA's property. If a homeowner advises that they had King County update the unit's records to show a smaller square footage than had been previously noted in the association documents, uh, does the owner have the ability to reduce their percentage of allocated interest or percentage of allocated common expenses because their unit is now reflected as smaller? And so the answer is in almost all cases going to be no, there is no change to the assessment obligation for an owner because there is a percentage stated in the declaration that each owner has for a percentage ownership interest and a percentage of common expense liability. That percentage does not change if you change the formula that you're using to calculate or someone comes in and remeasures the unit. Usually these surveys that are done for condominiums are done by professional surveyors. And I would trust that over what the county says regardless because the county may be using a different method of calculating the, the square footage. You know, I can tell you we frequently get owners disputing square footage calculations because they don't interpret the thickness of the walls within a unit to count as square footage, or they don't count closets, things like that. But the reality is the Condominium Act is very clear in stating that it doesn't matter what the formula is, if there is a table in the declaration that says what the percentage is, that table controls. So an owner getting the county to reduce the square footage does nothing to change their voting power or their common expense liability. It is possible to amend the percentages and we have had a couple clients do it. It requires 100% of the members to agree on the new allocation. And if you've got one owner trying to decrease their percentage, you are almost certainly going to have another owner objecting to their percentage being increased. It doesn't mean it's always that way, but I haven't seen this work for communities with more than about 10 units because we've seen communities with 10 units come to an agreement, but uh, I haven't seen a large community come to an agreement. And the owner basically, if their purpose in having the county change the square footage on the county records was to try and get a smaller expense for their unit, they just wasted their time because that is not a way to do it. The only way to change the percentages is an amendment to the declaration. And again, it would require 100% of the membership to approve that kind of a change. Uh, next one is we have a condo association that has a window request that was approved by the board with a stipulation that windows have white grids. The letter went on to stipulate that if the owner installed clear glass, uh, it would be a violation. The owner installed clear glass. Does the board have any 
ability to enforce the decision that they made. So the answer is yes, they can enforce using all of the enforcement mechanisms available. They can use fines, they can use litigation. If you have an arbitration provision in your declaration, you could use that. Uh, you can try convincing the owner that they should replace the window glass. Uh, it's frequently something which people don't understand the relative ease with which this particular violation can be cured. Usually when people say they've replaced a window, they're replacing the entire frame of the window with the, uh, the entire assembly. And it would be possible in most cases to simply replace the glass panels so that you have the correct appearance from the outside without replacing the entire frame. And that should be something that could be accomplished at a much lower cost, doesn't impact the siding system of the building. But it would be like any other violation. If the board was uh, specific about what was allowed in the approval for the change, then the board can enforce the, uh, the approved design. We recently had a homeowner request a work order to have an area of her subflooring, the cement level inspected. She plans to have new carpet installed, says the area of her floor has cement chipping and slopes downward. Would the carpet installer be able to, to pre-assess the flooring to assess the work? Um, our board understands the structural components of the building, including the flooring, may be common elements. So I'm going to try and not be specific because I can't answer a specific question for this particular floor. But I'd say that for condominiums, it is generally true that if you've got a slab on grade floor, that slab on grade floor and any foundation around it are going to be common elements. That's not true for all condominiums, but certainly it's true for, for many condominiums. And if the foundation is settling or the floor is settling in a way that is interfering with the use of the unit, there's certainly a chance, a good chance that the restoration of that problem is an association's obligation. The fix may be simple, the fix may be complex. Um, it may be that you can simply level out the floor with a self-leveling compound. That is something which a flooring contractor or carpet installer should be able to do, but it really starts to depend on how severe the settling is. You know, we've had clients that have had to go in and spend over $100,000 to actually try and lift a portion of the foundation to bring it back into an acceptable level of uh, compliance with what the original construction was. We certainly run into problems where individual owners will have very uh, high expectations of how level their floor should be, something which I would say is not realistic for construction. And so I think it is probably necessary for the board to evaluate a complaint by an owner about the common element floor being out of level. It would not be just something you'd want to rely on the owner's assessment or the owner's contractor. I think you'd probably need to bring in your own construction consultant to determine whether the floor is out of level and if it's out of level enough that it would constitute a problem the association is responsible for, or if it's something minor, which the owner should be expected to take care of as part of the floor, which they are responsible for. So, you know, I would say as with many things, one of the obligations the board's gonna have is to actually inquire and answer the question on whether or not it's, it is a problem and once they get that information, the board can determine based on their governing documents, what obligation they have to fix it. And I will also say there are, are some parts of condominiums where the board is responsible for maintaining, but there's just not the money to do it. And so the board may be balancing their obligation to maintain windows or 
concrete floors against their obligation to maintain roofing and chimneys. And they may choose that given the limited resources they have, they're not going to repair a window or repair a floor, which is not causing any damage to uh, the unit or the buildings. So uh, it, it can be a very complex question with a lot of details that you'll need to deal with. Uh, the last question I have is, I'm not clear about the following requirements for resale certificates. If you could address any or all, I'd appreciate it. As far as annual meeting minutes for the current year, are we obligated to include the draft meeting minutes for 2021 or just the approved minutes from 2020? So if not obligated, is it advised anyway? Generally, I would say it's advisable to provide more information rather than less information. Under the Condominium Act, there's no obligation to provide the minutes as part of the resale packet, but we do think it's a good idea. If you only have draft minutes, we would recommend that you provide the draft minutes. The Homeowner Association Act requires that a board produce within 60 days of their annual meeting, a draft set of minutes and distribute it to the owners. So if you've done that, I would include them in the resale certificate. Under UKIOA, you are required to provide the board meeting minutes and the annual meeting minutes for the most previous 12 months. Um, in the question, they had talked about a period of two years. I don't know where that came from, but UKIOA does specify association and board meeting minutes for the most, for, you know, the most previous 12 months. And if that means you have a draft of minutes for a annual meeting, I would include those, those as well. So the question goes on further about dealing with special assessments, which are contemplated, but not yet actually assessed. So we've been using verbiage like, the board is currently working on approving a special assessment in the amount of X dollars. This is scheduled to go before the membership for ratification soon or by X date. Is this language okay? The language sounds good to me as a general rule. I definitely prefer that if you know a major repair and a special assessment is coming up, that you say that in the resale certificate in a plain way. I've got a lot of clients that will say there's a special assessment of unknown amount. And if you know the magnitude, if you know it's gonna be in the tens of thousands of dollars a unit, I would prefer that you say it is in the tens of thousands of dollars a unit, even if you don't know the exact dollar amount. We have had litigation over special assessments come through our office on a regular basis where an association board <coughs> knew they were going to do it. The technical language of the resale certificate only says you have to disclose special assessments in excess of 5% of the annual budget, which have been approved by the board. But that doesn't tell the whole story. So we had one client that was sued because they were only, I think, 11% funded on their reserves and they did a special assessment to fund their reserves. An owner sued because she had purchased between the time the reserve study had been prepared and when that special assessment came out six months later. We have frequently had special assessments for major repairs, which were a month or, you know, a months or years in the planning that were undisclosed in resale certificates, but the sellers knew they were coming. And so the association got swept up in litigation against the seller because the seller didn't disclose it in their form 17 and the association didn't disclose it in their resale certificate. You're going to cause some sales to fail because if you disclose that there's a large special assessment there are gonna be buyers who will not purchase. And that's okay. That is the board's role to provide the information so that a buyer can make an informed decision. You are not hurting the seller by disclosing honestly what the financial circumstances are for your community. 
So we would recommend that be done. The question goes on and asks, if there's an obligation to update resale certificates that you've already sent out as information becomes available, there's not an obligation in the statute, but I would suggest that you should update and remember, you're actually trying, your obligation is to update to the seller of the unit. You update the resale certificate to the unit owner who has requested the resale certificate. So you don't have to go out and try and track down every potential buyer who had a copy of a resale certificate and find them. On the other hand, if you have information about the escrow and the uh, buyer of the unit, and you do learn something is missing from the resale certificate, or you have new information to disclose, we would recommend giving that information to the escrow agent and the realtor for the buyer to make sure that you don't have litigation following the sale of and closure of the unit. So <clears throat> I think we've run out of time and that's the last of my questions. If you've got other questions or we you have follow-ups, please send it to info at condolaw.net. And we will, I guess, see people next week. Thank you all for joining us. Definitely send those questions that we didn't get to to info at condolaw.net. Bye. Thank you. Thank you for doing this. Bye. You're very welcome.